Welcome to Washington Hospital Today, the program dedicated to sharing timely information about the community hospital that's been taking care of Washington Township Healthcare District residents since it opened in 1958. Washington Hospital Today is provided for the sole purpose of informing residents about healthcare topics and issues that have been covered during community forums, free health and wellness classes, or as part of educational sessions held during the district's open board meetings. This program is one more way that Washington Hospital helps empower you, the residents of the district, by providing information needed to make informed decisions about your health. It's a real pleasure to be here and to see so many people turn out uh, to hear this talk today. Uh, in no small part because I am going to be relying upon you guys after the talk to continue spreading the word to people you know and to become active on this issue because we have a, uh, an emerging crisis in healthcare in the United States that relates to running out of treatments for infections. So I'm going to start very quickly with my disclosures. It's been mentioned already. I have written Rising Plague, which is largely what I'm going to tell you about today. Uh, and I uh, have received research grants from the National Institutes of Health and several drug companies. I also have consulted for multiple companies developing antibiotics and uh, companies developing new infection control technologies. I'm going to start our story today with this man. This, uh, Dr. Lewis Thomas was one of the most prominent physicians of the 20th century. He was a winner of the Lasker Award, which is one notch below the Nobel Prize, and he was a member of the National Academy of Sciences. He uh, grew up in the pre-antibiotic era, and he started his medical training in the pre-antibiotic era, and his internship was the very year that sulfa antibiotics hit the market in the United States. And in 1983, he wrote a book called Notes of a Medicine Watcher in, in which he described the experience of the emergence of antibiotics and its impact on medicine. <coughs> Excuse me. He wrote that for most of the infectious diseases on the wards of Boston City Hospital in 1937, there was nothing that could be done beyond bed rest and good nursing care. And then came the explosive news of sulfonilamide, which was the first antibiotic in the US, and the start of the real revolution in medicine. I remember the astonishment when the first cases of lethal bloodstream infections were treated in Boston in 1937. The phenomenon was almost beyond belief. Here were moribund patients who would surely have died without treatment improving within a matter of hours and feeling entirely well within the next day. We became convinced overnight that nothing lay beyond the reach for the future. Medicine was off and running. Now if we advance seven decades from Dr. Thomas's internship, we find ourselves in the uncomfortable position of having a drying up of the antibiotic well. This graph shows the number of new antibiotics approved by the FDA per five-year periods. And um, there had been rumors for many years that companies were abandoning antibiotic development. And the Infectious Diseases Society of America began to talk to Congress about this problem. And, and what they were told was, you're giving us rumors and innuendo. Where's the hard data? Show us that this is actually happening. So we went to the FDA and worked with them and their internal databases and enumerated the number of antibiotics they were approving. And this was the resulting graph, which was published in 2004. And we felt at the time already documented quite an alarming trend in antibiotic development and approval. So these data became a cornerstone of the IDSA's Bad Bugs, No Drugs campaign. This was a white paper that the IDSA put together to lobby Congress, to educate Congress, and to talk to the media. We spent four years of active lobbying, uh, discussing things with media and Congress. And in 2008, we decided to go back and revisit this graph and see how successful our efforts had been. It turned out not so successful continued decline in antibiotic development during that four-year period. But of course, this was two years ago, and perhaps this was the bottom of things. And maybe we just had to invest in that first four to six-year period, and everything is turning around now. Not so much. We're halfway through the current five-year period. We've had one antibiotic approved. And frankly, I don't think it takes a statistician to look at this graph and see the trend. 
And I don't think there's any conclusion you can draw from looking at this graph other than that antibiotic development is dying. And that's the word I would use. It is dying. Unfortunately, at the same time, the microbes are not being nice about it, and they're not slowing down their resistance. In fact, quite the opposite. Their resistance is skyrocketing. These are USC Centers for Disease Control CDC data showing three resistant bacteria, including the famous methicillin-resistant Staph aureus, or MRSA, which has had a lot of media attention over the last couple of years. That's shown here. On this uh, map of the United States is shown another of the nastiest bugs that we deal with, which we call KPC Klebsiella. The importance of this organism, which first had its outbreak in New York City around 2004, is that it is resistant to all antibiotics except a drug that we stopped using in the 1960s because it's so toxic. That's the only drug that's left for this organism. It killed 50% of the people it infected in the original outbreak, despite treatment. And it then began to spread down the eastern seaboard and inland. This was the US CDC map in 2006. Here is the US CDC map today. In Los Angeles, we have not had a problem, and I suspect you have not had a problem with this organism. A month and a half ago, this organism hit our hospital. We had four patients infected. Two of them died. I don't know about the third. The third was on the way to dying when I went off service. Uh, the State Department, the uh, County Department of Health came out. They looked at the organisms we had seen. They were not related. These were four separate organisms that were brought in from the community to our hospital. These were not hospital-acquired infections. They were acquired in nursing homes. Uh, at the same time, LA County Public Health had 50 other reports. This organism is now endemic in Los Angeles, and it is on the way here to this community. Another of the tremendous antibiotic resistance problems we're having is with an organism called Acinetobacter. Uh, this organism is legendary for its ability to develop antibiotic resistance in the middle of a treatment course. You're treating it, the patient's getting better, two days later the fever comes back, their white count comes, uh, starts rising again, their blood pressure starts falling, and the organism is now resistant to what you are using to treat the organism with. This graph here shows uh, the percentage of bacteria that have been resistant to all first-line antibiotics. Again, the only thing we have left for this bug is this drug we stopped using in the 1960s because it's so toxic, and frankly, it's starting to become resistant to that drug as well. This, these data are out of date. In 2008, nationally, about a third. It's now two-thirds, two years later. Two-thirds of the bacteria in the United States are now resistant to everything except this one drug, colistin, and a substantial proportion are probably resistant to colistin as well. And aside from patients in hospitals acquiring this organism, the other population that has been devastated by this bacteria are our soldiers fighting in Iraq and Afghanistan. For reasons that are not entirely clear, there is an extremely high rate of infection of combat wounds with this bacteria. If you want to enumerate the costs of resistance, in 2002, the Centers for Disease Control calculated that there were 2 million Americans just in that year that acquired infections in hospitals. They didn't come to the hospital with an infection. They came to the hospital for another problem, and they picked their infection up in the hospital, and 100,000 of those people died of their hospital-acquired infections, almost all of which were caused by antibiotic-resistant bacteria. The antibiotic resistance has escaped the hospital. Methicillin-resistant Staph aureus, or MRSA, is an example of that, which kills tens of thousands of Americans per year. Not all of them, in fact, many of them, not in hospitals. And if you want to put a dollar amount on the cost of antibiotic resistance, just the cost of resistance, so this is added on top of the cost of a normal infection, uh, antibiotic resistance adds 20 to 30 or 40 billion dollars per year in U.S. healthcare expenditures. Part of our problem in dealing with these organisms is that we have a very skewed perspective on reality. So you hear all the time this concept that we're at war with microbes. Let's take a step back and think about that for a minute. Microbes outnumber, uh, uh, outnumber us by a factor of 10 to the 22. So you have to take every person on the planet and multiply that number by 10 to the 22. That's a one with 22 zeros after it. That's how many microbes there are on the planet. 
They're so numerous that despite their tiny size, they outweigh us by 100 million times. And they can replicate 500,000 times faster than we can. And they've been doing this for 1,000 times longer than our species has existed. And we're at war with them? I mean, the concept is hilarious that we could ever defeat microbes in a war. Furthermore, the weapons in any war with microbes would, of course, be antibiotics. But we need to remember, we did not invent antibiotics. We merely discovered them. Bacteria invented antibiotics. And the best guess is that they did this about 2 billion with a B years ago, which means they've been killing each other and defeating each other with antibiotics for 20 million times longer than we've even known antibiotics exist. These are their weapons. We are not going to defeat them with these weapons. So all of this was very uh, uh, pithily summarized by Nobel laureate Dr. Joshua Letterberg, who 10 years ago wrote that the future of humanity and microbes would likely evolve as episodes of our wits versus their genes. The extraordinary thing is that in the 10 years since he wrote this, as bacteria have continued to evolve and adapt and use their genes to defeat antibiotics, we've stopped using our wits to keep up with them. So why is that? Why is antibiotic development dying? There are a variety of causes, but they can be generally grouped into one of two major categories. The first is economic and the second is regulatory. Of the economic factors, again, there are a variety of factors present, but by far the biggest impact, and the one that's also most addressable, is simply that antibiotics have a poor return on investment relative to other classes of drugs. You take an antibiotic for seven days, your infection is cured, and you stop. And companies have figured out they can make a lot more money selling a drug you have to take every day for the rest of your life, like a blood pressure drug, cholesterol, arthritis, dementia, uh, diabetes. They make much more money selling these other drugs, and so they've simply stopped developing antibiotics because it's not cost effective for them to do so. This return on investment concern is in the background of skyrocketing costs to develop new drugs, period. The, the most recent estimates of the cost to develop a drug through FDA approval is over a billion dollars which is a 1,300% increase in 30 years. That outpaces inflation by tenfold. Perhaps it's not surprising in the background of skyrocketing costs, companies are increasingly focusing their R&D budgets on higher return on investment drugs. So I'm not an economist, but this formula seems to make sense to me. If you tell a company you're gonna to need to spend more money and in return you're gonna make less money, that is not a good thing to say for the future of antibiotic development. So what are we going to do about this problem? The, the fix is actually conceptually very simple. We need legislation that creates economic incentives to draw industry back into the antibiotic game. We need to change the return on investment calculation for antibiotics. This can be done by decreasing the cost of development and there's a variety of ideas out there about how to do that. Grants, contracts, tax credits, liability protection for antibiotics. Or we need to increase sales linked to antibiotics. And again, there's a variety of ideas out there how to do it. Guaranteed markets, patent extensions, prizes, market exclusivity, lots of ideas. We need Congress to pick four or five of their favorite ideas that make the most fiscal sense to them, that they feel are responsible, and put them into legislation to bring industry back into the antibiotic development business. The bottom line is this, and I hear people say this all the time, why don't we just make them? Why don't we just force them to make these drugs? We can't. There is no mechanism by which we can force a company to develop a specific type of drug. We can't make them develop new antibiotics. We have to make them want to develop new antibiotics. So why do we not have these incentives yet? These are not new ideas. These ideas were in the Bad Bugs, No Drugs paper in 2004. That's six years ago. And the answer is very simple. It's toxic pharmaceutical politics, and that's the actual term that's used on Capitol Hill. Mention pharmaceutical uh, uh, um, ince economic incentives and watch them pucker up, turn around, and walk away. And the reason is very simple. Politicians are reactive to the concerns of their constituents. If their constituents are not aware of a problem or are not interested in a problem, they are not going to stick their necks out to fix the problem. 
We need a grassroots movement to put pressure on politicians to act. And I have to say that uh, for a variety of reasons, in just the last three to six months, there has been a sea change in thought on Capitol Hill on this issue. And we are now getting strong signals that both the, the House and the Senate, as well as the White House, are strongly interested in creating some form of economic incentive to re-stimulate antibiotic development. We need to continue putting pressure on them. Now, I said there were two problems with antibiotic development. The first was economic, and the second is regulatory. I'm not going to uh, bore you with the agonizing statistical arguments which have resulted in the regulatory problem. I'm going to try to take a top-down view. The bottom line is this. The Food and Drug Administration has been changing the criteria that is required to get a new antibiotic approved, such that at the current time, no one knows what the criteria are, including the FDA. Internally, they don't even know what they want. And so companies risk putting a billion dollars into a development program and getting all the way to the end and then not having the drug approved because the FDA has changed its mind and doesn't know what it wants to see in the development program. Now, why is this happening? This is happening, as I alluded to, because there are hyper-conservative, radical, skeptical statisticians, both external and internal at the FDA, who do not see the world the way you and I see the world. They see the world through the eyes of statistics, and they're very rigid about the way they see the world through statistical eyes. So they have said, we need to know exactly how effective antibiotics are. If you can't tell us that number with the statistical precision we need, you're not going to be we're not going to approve these drugs. So let me tell you how bad this got. In 2007, the Infectious Disease Society of America had a series of phone calls with the FDA, and on some of those phone calls, we were told by FDA officials that they were, if they couldn't solve the statistical problem, that they were considering the possibility of requiring future studies of antibiotics for the treatment of pneumonia to be placebo controlled. In other words, we would randomize patients to receive placebo or drug to prove that drugs were better than placebo. Now, let me remind the audience Dr. William Osler is perhaps the most famous physician of the last two millennia. And his standard textbook of medicine, which was the textbook of medicine for decades, in 1901, he referred to community-acquired pneumonia as the captain of the men of death because it was the leading killer of Americans. And you now want physicians to randomize their patients with this disease to a 50% chance of being treated with placebo? It was utter madness. Utter madness. So in response, the IDSA went to the FDA and said, we would like to have a workshop with you. And let's bring in experts from all over the world. And let's talk about clinical trials for pneumonia so we can figure out how to solve the statistical problem. And to their credit, the FDA agreed. And so this workshop was held in early 2008. And people at the FDA and people at the IDSA dug into historical literature that no one had looked at in a half century. These are papers from the 1930s and 40s. You know, the physicians back then didn't have modern technology. They didn't have randomized placebo controlled trials. They didn't exist. But they weren't dummies. They did do studies. They did try to figure out if these drugs worked. Were the studies perfect by modern standards? No, but this was the cutting edge at the time. And if you go to their literature and you summarize the effect of these drugs in terms of saving lives, the death rate from pneumonia, irrespective of age, doesn't matter how old you were, no matter how old you were, the death rate from pneumonia plummeted with the availability of antibiotics. These are, this is how much antibiotics decrease death depending on age of the patient if they had pneumonia. These are some of the largest declines in death you will find from any intervention in all of medicine. They're massive. And so frankly, what this argument is about is that the statisticians have simply lost the forest through the trees. So let's take a step back and ask from a macro perspective, from a global perspective, what was the overall impact of antibiotics beyond pneumonia? Can we enumerate how effective these drugs are? If you look at the death rate from infections in the, <laughs> in the United States, 
over the first 15 years of the antibiotic era, the death rate from infections in the United States fell by 220 deaths per 100,000 population. You say, well, what does that mean? I don't know what that number means. Well, let me tell you what it means. Over the next half century, from the early 1950s to the late 1990s, which witnessed the introduction of every other medical technology, intensive care unit medicine, mechanical ventilators to breathe for people who can't breathe on their own, medicines to keep blood pressures elevated when sepsis is making the blood pressure fall dangerously, organ transplantation, complex surgeries, all of it reduced deaths from infections by only 20 per 100,000, less than a tenth as much as occurred immediately after the introduction of antibiotics. So why are we even having this discussion? I mean, this is like counting angels on the head of a pin. They have lost the forest through the trees. If you look at individual infections, the decline in death, as I said, is astronomical. Whether it's pneumonia, heart infections, brain infections, even skin infections, which no one dies from nowadays, these are mundane, had an 11% death rate before antibiotics. That's as much as the death rate from heart attacks is in the modern era. Death from skin infections at the same rate as dying from heart attacks. And if you want to know the death reduction of antibiotics, again, here's the magnitude. Aspirin and clot-busting drugs for heart attacks reduce deaths by 3%. These are the most effective medical interventions that we have. So I'm going to share with you two anecdotes that underscore this point. These are both true stories. The first is one of the earliest ever trials that studied how effective antibiotics were were conducted by two physicians in Glasgow, Scotland. And they took people with skin infections, and they didn't have randomization. That technology did not exist, so they alternated. They said, every other patient who comes into the hospital, we're going to give this new antibiotic to, and every other patient is going to get standard of care medicine, which at that time was UV lamp therapy. So, so you come in with a skin infection, and they wheel out a UV lamp, and they shine it on your arm, and if you survive, you go home with a nice suntan. That's what they were doing back then, before antibiotics. That was the cutting edge of medicine. Now, these were very careful investigators, and they made sure that every element of care was exactly the same between the, these populations of patients, with the exception of antibiotic versus UV lamp. So as an example, everyone admitted to the hospital with a skin infection got put on a liquid diet. And it wasn't just any liquid diet. It was a, there was a specific formula, which included Horlicks malted milk, arrowroot, corn flour, and by the way, you were not allowed to eat onions. No onions allowed, and this is explicitly stated. And you say, well, why were they doing this? What does this liquid diet with Horlicks malted milk and no onions have to do with a skin infection? Well, it doesn't have anything to do with skin infections, and they knew it. So why were they doing it? They were doing it because they had no interventions. They were giving functional placebos to provide psychological reassurance to patients. That's all they had. They knew if they didn't do anything, nobody would come to the hospital. They had to do something. But that wasn't the only thing they did to provide psychological reassurance. Because the other thing is, and this is a direct quote from the paper, on admission, each patient was given a soap and water enema, which was repeated, quote unquote, when necessary. Thereafter, the same laxative, liquid paraffin, was used when required. Now again, why were they giving enemas to people who had a skin infection? They knew that this was not an effective therapy. Uh, but I submit to you that having a squirt gun jammed up your rectum and getting blasted in your colon with a hot liquid paraffin soap and water enema would indeed leave the impression with the patient that something had been done. <laughs> and that's why they were doing it. One more anecdote, and this is a true story. A four-year-old girl in late 1942 in excellent health, had never been sick before, suddenly develops an infection on her face, which progresses relentlessly over four days. On the evening of the third night, her face and neck are so swollen, she can't swallow her own saliva. And on the morning of the fourth day, when she begins gasping for breath, her parents finally, in a panic, rush her to the Mayo Clinic. And this is what she looks like on arrival to the hospital. 
Her admitting physician described her as being moribund, which means on the verge of death. And her parents were told that she would be dead in two days and there wasn't anything anybody could do to stop it. Imagine being told that about your four-year-old who four days earlier had been perfectly well. She was very lucky because Dr. Harrell at the Mayo Clinic was one of the very few people in the United States who had access to penicillin before the end of World War II. He went to his laboratory. He grabbed what we would consider today to be absurdly low doses of penicillin, a thousandfold less than we would use today. And he began treating her. And this is what she looked like after a few days of penicillin. Antibiotics are the only medical intervention that can take a patient who looks like this on day one and turn them into a patient who looks like this just a few days later. Now, I showed these slides at an FDA advisory committee meeting in late 2008. And at the break, Dr. Jim Steckelberg, who's the chief of, I of infectious diseases at the Mayo Clinic, came up to me. And he told me at that time, the little girl in these pictures was alive and well and still receiving her care at the Mayo Clinic. Penicillin had given her a seven-decade lease on life. It is not an overstatement to say that antibiotics revolutionized the practice of medicine. They enabled complicated surgery, chemotherapy to treat cancers, aspects of critical care medicine like mechanical ventilators to breathe for you, <coughs> care for premature babies, organ transplantation, and frankly, when you read Dr. Lewis Thomas, they fundamentally changed the practice of medicine from a diagnostic profession, where the focus was just on, let me describe what you have so I can tell you how long you have, to an interventional profession, where the focus was on, I'm gonna tell you what you have so I can figure out what treatment to give you. Antibiotics did this. They are the only drugs that lose efficacy in a communicable, man a communicable manner over time. The more you use these drugs, the less effective they become. And that is a unique feature of antibiotics. It is not true of any other drug class. If we don't develop any new blood pressure drugs in the next 50 years, that's fine. The stuff we have today is going to work just as well 50 years today as it does today. But that's not true of antibiotics. So our premise is that we need to think of antibiotics as a precious limited resource, just like fisheries, forestry, and energy. Yes, we need to conserve these drugs to slow down the spread of resistance, but if all we do is conserve and we don't restore, all we're doing is delaying the inevitable exhaustion of the resource. We have to both conserve and restore this resource. Now, outside of the issue of developing new antibiotics, there is legislation that has seen the light of day in Congress and just not been voted on which would massively strengthen our federal response to antibiotic resistance, and this is called the STAR Act. It's been introduced into two consecutive Congresses. It's now being introduced again into the current Congress. It has never even been voted on. This bill needs to be introduced and passed by Congress. I opened with the words of Dr. Lewis Thomas. I'm going to start the closing segment with the words of one of his colleagues. Dr. Walsh McDermott, another of the leading physicians of the 20th century. Dr. McDermott was also a Lasker Award winner, also a member of the National Academy of Sciences. In fact, he was the first president of the newly established medical board of the National Academies, which was a precursor to the Institute of Medicine. This is the leading medical body scientifically in the United States. In the 1950s, Dr. McDermott oversaw efforts to bring modern medicines to very isolated Navajo Indian communities in the southwestern United States. And of these efforts, he wrote in 1960, with today's antibiotics, it is possible to place in the hands of a barefoot, non-literate villager more real power to affect the outcome of a critically ill patient than could have been exerted by the most highly trained urban physician of 25 years ago. And he would know, because he was a highly trained urban physician of 25 years ago. In 1981, shortly before his passing, he wrote a retrospective on his career in medicine. And he wrote that it is not too much to state that the introduction of antibiotics has represented a force for change in the 20th century of the same general kind as James Watt's modification of the steam engine did in the 18th. The crossing of the watershed could be felt at the time 
One day we could not save lives or hardly any lives, and on the very next day we could do so across a wide spectrum of diseases. This was an awesome acquisition of power. What must Dr. McDermott and Dr. Thomas say were they alive today to bear witness to the evaporation of that power? So what do we need? We do need to much better conserve the antibiotics that we have. We need to not waste them in humans or in animals. 70% of the antibiotic use in this country is not in humans, it's in animals. And the vast majority of that use is not to treat sick animals, it is to promote the growth of livestock so farmers make more money when they sell them. It's added to animal feed as a growth promoter. That needs to stop. We need better infection control practices for hospitals. We want the infections not to happen in the first place so we don't have to use an antibiotic to treat them. We need technologies. Just nagging people to wash their hands doesn't work. We need technologies to make up for the fact that we know people are never going to be 100% compliant at washing hands. We need to clean the environment more effectively in hospitals. We need better research at the national level and we need to rekindle antibiotic development with economic incentives and a sane regulatory environment. What can you do? Four things. Number one, wash your hands. I know that sounds simple and mundane, but that's what it's all about. We interact with our environment with our hands. That's how you pick up these bugs. Will that totally protect you? No but it's the most effective intervention you have to reduce your risk of picking up one of these bugs. Number two, live a healthy lifestyle so that you don't have to go to the hospital. Will living a healthy lifestyle guarantee that you don't have to go to the hospital? No. You can get sick even if you've done all the right stuff. But if you do all the right stuff, you will decrease your chances of ending up in the hospital where the nastiest of the nasty bugs live. If you are in the hospital, number three, Work with your medical team, your social workers, to get out of the hospital as soon as you can. You would be surprised how often I have my patients tell me, doctor, I feel like you're rushing me out of the hospital. Well, guess what? I am, because I've seen what happens when people stay in the hospital. You don't want it. Get out as soon as you can. Number four, write your congressman. If you go to the Infectious Disease Society of America website, www.idsociety.org, there is an advocacy link. Click on that link. There are pre-printed letters to your congressman. If you type in your zip code, it will tell you who your congressman is, and you can, pre -pop, you can uh, modify the letter, click send, and the letter will go to your congressman's office. I wrote the book, as I said before, because we've been talking to ourselves for years and it's not working. We have to talk to you guys and you guys have to talk to your congressman. That's how this problem gets solved. The IDSA <laughs> in April launched a new initiative called 10 by 20. This calls for the development of, new, of 10 new antibiotics by the year 2020 and it is a riff on JFK's call to go to the moon in 10 years and it will require the same degree of technological advancement and buy-in from government, industry, academia, and philanthropy to make it a reality. These are the stakes. These are the faces of antibiotic resistant infections. We're not just talking about nursing home patients, okay? We're talking about 17-year-old high school honor roll student athletes dead of an MRSA pneumonia despite maximal medical therapy. We're talking about a 12-year-old who goes on a school camping trip, picks up influenza, comes back, gets super infected with an antibiotic resistant bacteria, dead despite maximal medical therapy. We're talking about a 22-year-old Brazilian supermodel who had a kidney stone, it's pretty common, gets treated for a kidney stone, develops in the community a highly antibiotic resistant strain of a, a bacteria called Pseudomonas in her urine, which spilled into her blood, caused septic shock. She ended up uh, developing gangrene in her hands and feet, which were amputated in an attempt to save her life, and she died anyway. We're talking about a, a boy who, while surviving his bout with MRSA, spent a year in the hospital and racked up a million dollar bill. And we're talking about a 21 year old college football star in the prime of health dead in three days of a multi-drug resistant bacterial infection acquired in the community. And my friend, my personal friend, it's not this guy, it's this guy who was built like a linebacker and in the community 
acquired a highly antibiotic resistant strain of E. coli. He developed a disease called diverticulitis, which is very common. And he was given an oral antibiotic because his physician didn't know, didn't know what the bacteria was. He failed the oral antibiotic because the bacteria was resistant. He eroded a hole in his colon, had eight inches of his colon whacked out, and spent four months with a colostomy bag and damn near died. This is the cost of antibiotic resistance. These are the stakes that confront us. And with that, I'll stop. Thank you. Why are all the big pharmacy companies only spending money on antibiotics? I believe in the former Soviet Union in Tbilisi, Georgia, they used to have something called phagus, which used to kill most of the infectious bacteria. Why don't we spend more yeah. money and time on that? Yeah, it's a good question. The question relates to, are there other ways to treat infections aside from antibiotics? And one technology is called, quote unquote, phage technology. What is a phage? A phage is a virus that infects bacteria and kills bacteria. But viruses don't just infect us, they infect bacteria too. Phage technology was studied very thoroughly in the 1920s and 30s before the availability of antibiotics. And even after antibiotics, phage uh, technology continued to be used mostly in Eastern Europe in the uh, former USSR. The fact is that they don't work very well. They were studied. And when antibiotics came along, antibiotics were better. And so uh, bacteria develop resistance to phages just like they develop resistance to antibiotics at the same rate. Uh, the phage is a living biological thing which you have to inject into a person, which makes the FDA obviously a little bit uncomfortable. And frankly, as a physician, would make me uncomfortable. So when would I use phages? I would use a phage if it was available if I had no antibiotics to use. But if I have an antibiotic to use, I'm not using a phage. And so is it, uh, is it a good idea to develop that technology? I think it's a perfectly adequate, perfectly fine idea to look at as an adjunct but it is not going to replace the need for new antibiotics. They're in the uh, back of the room. So there's not much economic incentive for the private pharmaceutical companies to pursue the development and research of antibiotics. I wondered if any of that was going on in government agencies like the CDC or the NIH. Yeah, that's another good question, and it's one of the most common questions I get asked. So let me state this as clearly as I can. Government doesn't develop drugs. They never have, and they never will. The government funds basic science research, and they do have new programs that can help companies uh, get past certain milestones where they tend to get stuck. The problem with government is that it can't innovate. The, what, and I'm speaking as someone who is the recipient of NIH grant money. So I'm kind of familiar with this problem. Um, the, the federal government funds basic science. You create a foundation of knowledge that then technologists who have very unique skills can come in and develop a technology to address on top of that knowledge. So as a NIH funded investigator, I can't I, I don't have the skills, I don't have the infrastructure, I don't have the resources or the expertise to do technology development. What it takes to get a drug developed is amazing. I mean, if you spend time at large companies and you talk to them about, well, take me through the process. There are a dozen or more departments, organic chemistry, there's people who focus on, well, listen, uh, currently to make this drug, I have to do 16 steps of manufacturing. I'll start with 10 kilograms of raw material, and I'll end up with one microgram, one millionth of a gram of drug at the end of that. I, my job is to reduce that to five steps and increase the yield on production fivefold. That's before you even get to testing it against bacteria, testing it for toxicity, testing it in animals, developing a clinical program. The amount of resources it takes is vastly more than the government has at its disposal. The uh, pharma R&D budget globally, if you look at all pharma mem all members of the pharma, uh, um, they have a working group at pharma. 
And if you look at the member companies' R&D budgets, it is more than twice as big as the NIH's budget. And, that, and those budgets are spent specifically to develop drugs, whereas NIH's budget is diffused against, uh, around finding new discoveries, new mechanisms, basic science, not technology. So government is not going to be the answer to this problem in that sense. However, one of the ideas that I have become increasingly attractive to, attracted to, as has the IDSA, the Infectious Disease Society of America, is a public-private partnership where you match federal dollars and private dollars, and you provide federal expertise and private expertise in a nonprofit whose mission is not to make money, whose mission is to create societally needed new drugs. The importance of this is, if pharma's problem is they're not making money on these drugs, let's take money off the table. Let's develop the drugs we need, not the drugs we're going to make money off of. This is not going to replace pharma, but it could be a very important supplement to the pharma model. So that idea is gaining traction. Did that answer your question? Okay. Start to move around. Are we, uh, are we seeing, uh, are, is, are there other countries other than ours seeing the same thing as we are? Yes, uh, good question. Antibiotic resistance is a global problem. Um, the, uh, I mentioned to you this acinetobacter, which is resistant to almost everything, and hits hospital patients in the United States as well as military personnel. There have been outbreaks in Madagascar. I mean, this is a global issue. It doesn't even relate to industrialization. Even underdeveloped countries have had terrible antibiotic resistance problems. In terms of drug development, most pharmaceutical, the big pharmaceutical companies are, are multinational. Small companies are not. Almost all of them are US-based. There are, there are some in Japan that are active, um, but uh, most companies have egressed from Europe and are not based in Canada for price control reasons. So this is, uh, the United States is the engine that drives antibiotic discovery for the world. There is a caveat. I am told by people in pharma that as the U.S. regulations become increasingly incomprehensible and burdensome, and as the Chinese market continues to expand, in 10 years it may well be that drug companies develop drugs for China. And, say, and they may well say to the United States, okay, you guys don't want drugs. We're not developing drugs for you. We're not even going to submit applications to the FDA because we can't get them through. We're going to just sell our, all our drugs in China. Maybe. But if they're not FDA approved, we can't prescribe them. Um, I have a very personal um, investment in this whole topic because since 2008, every six months I've been hospitalized with pneumonia and sepsis. And um, the first time I was uh, told, my husband was told that I was probably going to die. And they weren't really sure what caused it, and they hung several different antibiotics. And within five to seven days, I'm perfectly well. But it happens every six months, and my six months are due. And it's a very frightening thing that I'm facing. And um, I would like to know more why the government doesn't get involved in this when if this is supposed to be considered like a war, I mean, they're always talking about, you know, let's take care of the terrorists because of the wars and all this type of stuff. This is a war that we're facing. I don't understand why they don't take a more active role. I mean, maybe you should send them your book to read or maybe you should send it to Oprah because she <laughs> tends to get things done. But well, I have a very personal, you know, um, well, feeling about this. All I can say is amen. Uh, you're, you're preaching to the choir. I don't understand. The, the only answer I can give you again is that government tends to respond to widespread public concern. The antibiotic resistance problem is just starting to appear on the sort of national consciousness. I don't think anybody understands that we're not developing new antibiotics. I don't think the public understands that at all. That's a new message, and we haven't done a good job of getting it out to them. Um, we have had senators and House people we've sent the book to. We have met with them. 
we have, we're, the IDSA is constantly talking to politicians on the Hill about this problem. We've tried to get on Oprah, we can't. Okay, we got on Dr. Oz, but we couldn't get on Oprah. No, we, we couldn't get on Oprah. If you can get me on Oprah, that, that would be very helpful. That would be very helpful. Hi, my name's uh, Sue Ann, and I sort of work in the Petri dish uh, environment. I work in education and uh, a junior high school. And I know that we're all gonna rush out and wash our hands after this meeting, but we have time to do that. And on a grassroots, grassroots basis, um, encouraging the washing of hands, I think is really important. I encourage our kids, my kids, to do that. But our school system doesn't allow enough time, passing time, to let the kids wash their hands. Um, we don't have, the majority of my rooms don't have sinks in them, Kay. so I can't get my kids to wash their hands. I, I have um, the disinfectant on my desk, but now I'm understanding that that doesn't really hit all of the diseases. So and, and I'm frustrated in the education system on how to deal with that. That's a grassroots roots thing. You know, we're going to talk to our congressman. We're going to get Oprah to put your book up. You know, but we also need to encourage our school systems to keep our kids healthy. So I agree with you completely. Hand washing is the cornerstone of preventing these infections. But let me just clear up a couple of things. Uh, soap and water hand washing uh, is very effective, but it isn't the only way that you can do it. Alcohol-based hand wash uh, uh, foams or gels are perfectly effective. And you don't have to be at a sink. You don't have to be tied at a sink. You can dispense it in your hand, walk away, and rub as you're walking away. That's what hospitals do. If we spent, we're supposed to do this before and after every time we walk into a room, patient's room. If we went to the sink and washed for 20 seconds with soap and water every time we did that, we would spend all day at the sink. We can't. So what they do is they put on the wall a dispenser with alcohol foam. Squirt, walk away, rub, done. Perfectly effective. The only thing it's not going to work for is C. diff, which you're not going to have in the classroom. That's a hospital problem. So all the stuff that you're going to have in the classroom, including methicillin-resistant Staph aureus or MRSA, alcohol foams and gels are perfectly adequate for. So I would strongly encourage your school system to either put dispensers on the wall for the kids or to just have liquid dispenser bottles, you know, little squirt bottles, in the rooms and have kids regularly. That's perfectly effective. This gentleman's been waiting a long time. Hi. I'm interested in the technology, um, specifically the one area you mentioned, uh, various bacteria apparently are they're both a number of them are still surviving, so they must be winning. They're, they're they're doing something to win, and you referred to injecting viruses, which I would, which I would agree with you is a little little strange. But are, are, is there any property of the bacteria that seem to overcome the others that can be co-opted somehow? And the other one is exotic plants, and I'm I'm sh there have been people scouring the jungles for for 100 years at least. Is there any, any big chance here? Yeah, so it's a good question. You're, you're basically saying, how can we find new ways to kill these bugs? Um, and there is obviously tremendous scientific interest in that question. Uh, there are companies that have libraries of molecules, chemicals, that are literally millions of different types of chemicals. And what they do is they have automated assays where they have robots squirt all of the chemicals into different plates with different bacteria to see which chemicals kill which bacteria. Can any of these be turned into drugs? That is how antibiotics are discovered. Um, there are certainly going to be new ways that couldn't be found to kill these bugs. There's no way we've exploited every possible. I mean, all an antibiotic is is a poison. An antibiotic is just a poison that's poisonous for the bacteria, but not for us. That's all it is. There's nothing magical about it. You've got to find a way to poison the bug, and there is no way we have exhausted all those possibilities. One of the most exciting areas to exploit is that it turns out that we have cultured less than 1% of all types of bacteria. We can't grow more than 99% of the bacteria in the world. We don't know how to grow them. 
You know they're there because you can see them under the microscope, but when you try to grow them, they won't grow. And there is emerging technology to trick those bacteria into growing in the lab. Those bacteria make antibiotics. And we think that may be a rich source for new discovery of new antibiotics. Now, you mentioned technology, so I'm going to mention one other thing. And I've talked to the hospital staff here about this technology. I consult for a company called Zymec. Zymec has a device that's about the size of a shopping cart. You wheel it into a hospital room, you close the door, and you press a remote control button, and the device mists the entire room in antiseptic. It takes 10 minutes to fill the room with antiseptic micro mist. It covers every surface in the room. You then let the mist dwell for 10 minutes, which is how long the Environmental Protection Agency says you need to contact antiseptic with surface to kill bacteria. And then a vacuum device turns on that sucks all of the remaining mist into the device. And after 30 minutes, when you open the door, the room is dry to the touch. There's no residue. If you think about how we clean rooms now, the patient gets discharged from the room, the housekeeping staff walks into the room, they squirt antiseptic in a couple places and immediately wipe it up because nobody's going to sit there and wait for 10 minutes to wipe it up. They don't have that kind of time. They don't <coughs> squirt antiseptic everywhere in the room. They only do it on a select number of surfaces. It's variably done. So we're not cleaning rooms as well as we should be cleaning rooms. And it's not anybody's fault. It's just limitation of time, resources, and human nature. Well, this is what I'm saying. We need technologies that overcome the limitations of human behavior, whether it's the Zymec technology or another type, hy uh, hydrogen peroxide gas. We need to find new ways to sterilize the environment in hospitals. Hello, thank you very much for the enlightening discussion. And I had a follow-up question um, based on um, the comment made by the lady who said that she had been in the hospital approximately every six months since 2008 with a recurrent very serious infection. And I wanted to ask if that tends to be an emergent pattern where some infections seem to be recurrent after an extended period of time. Uh, <clears throat> the answer is yes, some infections can recur. Pneumonia does not tend to be one that does, so I'd like to talk to you about exactly what's going on. There are ways that that might be happening. Um, MRSA is a classic one that recurs. So this is the staph bacteria that's spilled into communities that's very virulent, very antibiotic resistant. Uh, it tends to come back over and over. We see people with two, three, four, five, all the way up to 10 or 15 recurrences. And then eventually it tends to burn itself out and we don't know why it recurs and we don't know why it burns itself out. So yes, some infections can repeatedly recur. Okay, more questions? Hi, thank you. Um, my question is, we travel, and when we travel, I see a lot of people in the pharmacies, and you can buy whatever drug you want for yeah. whatever you think you have. And a lot, when I speak to the pharmacists, sometimes they, say they sell a lot of antibiotics. Yeah. So do you think the self-treating by people is encouraging? <clears throat> um, you're exactly right. Uh, as bad as we are in the United States at many things with respect to antibiotics, we actually are better than a lot of other parts of the world where there is no control over antibiotic use. You don't even need a prescription. And you can get very powerful antibiotics just off the shelf. This is the cause of this new strain, which some of you may have seen in the news last week, called NDM1, which has emerged in India. This NDM1 is an E. coli. It's a simple E. coli. E. coli is in all of us. It is a normal part of our flora in our body. The NDM1 strain is resistant to all antibiotics except this drug I mentioned earlier that we stopped using in the 60s because it's so toxic. And in some of the reported cases, it was resistant to that drug also. So imagine E. coli that can't be treated. Millions of women per year in the United States get urinary tract infections from E. coli. We can't treat them anymore. We got nothing. Intra-abdominal infections, appendicitis, diverticulitis caused by E. coli. If that NDM1 strain spreads in this country, we're in big trouble. And that NDM1 strain almost certainly emerged because of uncontrolled use of antibiotics in exactly the manner you're talking about. Okay, 
I think in the interest of time, we're going to wrap up the questions now. Um, thank you very much to Dr. Spellberg for presenting today. Um, as uh, we mentioned before, he works at UCLA, which means he had to fly up from LA this morning. So thank you very much for taking time out of your day.